Governor Maura Healy, thank you so much for being here. It's great to be with you. So we'll talk about your arts agenda in just a moment, but first, let's talk about you and the arts. What's your go-to when, when you need your fix or, or you need that, that balm? Well, aren't we lucky here in Massachusetts? Uh, not just in greater Boston, but around the state. And, you know, it is something that I really appreciate, whether it's going to a museum, going to a bookstore to look for the latest editions, um, going to explore some of our open studios, our galleries. I like to listen to music, and we have such a variety of music halls and, and concert venues around the state. So no shortage of things to take in. So you're a live music person. We saw Brandy Carlisle at your inauguration. You're a yeah. live music person. I love live music, and I love Brandy, and invited her to come play at my inauguration, which she did. Uh, she'll be back in Massachusetts. Massachusetts in just a few months, and hopefully I'll see her again. But uh, so many great acts, spring coming, now our outdoor venues will be available, and it's just great. You spent a couple of years in Europe playing basketball, of course, but Austria, that's a very arts-rich environment, especially in Europe, especially in Austria, Vienna. Does that at all inform how you look at the arts and what we should be doing in this country and here in Massachusetts? Well, I think it starts a little bit further back even. I grew up uh, loving arts and, and antiquities and auctions. My family was involved in, in, in auctions and the auction business and particularly antiquities. And I think that that's, that's where some of this began. Um, certainly living, I lived in Salzburg. It's home to Mozart. And so that was next level in terms of exposure to, to arts and, and throughout Europe. I traveled a lot in Europe and you're able to visit different museums and, and the like. And so there's that. And then I think here within Massachusetts, particularly after COVID, I mean, we really, really, I think, have collectively developed a new appreciation for the arts and culture and shows and things that we could not see for a period of time. And hopefully that helps folks understand just how important and fundamental they are to our way of life, to the social fabric of community, um, to who we are. And that's why I come to this job now as your governor, wanting to do as much as we can to both celebrate arts and culture here in the state and also invest in it like we haven't before. Is it worthy of a cabinet level position with you? Well, we'll see about that. I can tell you we're not wasting any time in getting started with our investments. Record investments proposed for Mass Cultural Council. Uh, we also proposed some tax credits, uh, relief for um, those who were engaged in movie production in the state, and also pre-Broadway, post-Broadway production. The idea will be provide some live theater tax credits to both attract more people and talent to Massachusetts and help those who are in the business. Uh, $3 million in a fund just for our independent movie theaters to help them buy new screens. I think about the funding that we have for workforce and apprenticeship th programs through the arts, as well as tourism. We've got a $6 million program that helps direct people uh, to places, cool places in the arts to visit across Massachusetts. So you'll hear our administration not only investing in the arts, but uh, visiting our wonderful arts and culture institutions around the state and trying to find ways to really lift them up and celebrate them. Going back to the theater tax credit that you just mentioned, we, we know well the movie tax credit here. We see it all around us now, but there's never been traction for a live theater credit. What, what, what was the, f the fulcrum point for you to see the value in that? Well, you know, we have so many shows uh, coming through Massachusetts and so much production within Massachusetts, but we could do even more to support live theater in this state. Again, this is an industry, a space, so hard hit during the pandemic. So my view was, let's find ways to support live theater throughout Massachusetts. Uh, many of these are small businesses, right? So we also have additional assistance for $78 million in, in grants for small businesses. But this special targeted tax credit for those doing live theater. I talk to artists all the time, of course. I, I know there are myriad issues they're facing from, from lost revenue to lack of rehearsal space, lack of studio space. What do you see, what have you identified as some of the most critical areas of need in the arts community now? I think housing has to be the top, far and away, the top issue. And I was over in East Somerville the other day. There's a wonderful uh, pottery gallery over there. And 
uh, potters working and, and they do all sorts of training, have school kids in and just members of the public can go and take classes and it's also studio space. And so I was talking with a number of the artists there and to a person, they all talk about housing, housing, the high cost of housing. Rents have gone up, housing prices have gone up. And so, you know, one of the top goals of our administration is to increase housing production around the state. Because whether you're in the Berkshires or Cape and Islands or in Suffolk County or Middlesex County, I mean, across the state, we need, just need to find ways to increase housing production and lower costs and make housing more accessible to people. That's really, I think, the top priority right now. The arts as an economic engine, what's kind of befuddled me and made me cross at times is the fact that people don't understand what the arts brings. Pre-pandemic, it was $2.2 billion in revenue that was generated, $100 million in taxes, and 70-something thousand jobs. What's there to be leveraged? I mean, how do you see that as an economic engine, the, the arts as a whole? I've seen great shows lately, including Six and Hamilton again. Um, Into the Woods was in, in town as well. But I think about the productions and the arts uh, and what's happening around our state, around our state. And they truly are uh, so essential. I mean, you think about the jobs created. This is why we need to invest more. Our state, Jared, actually lags behind other states when it comes to investments in the arts. And this is a space that is a $2 billion uh, contributor to our economy, $128 million in revenue every year alone. We could be doing even more, right? Um, and so part of what we've proposed in the budget and in our tax relief package are ways to really make that investment in the arts. Um, one thing I think is exciting, though, to talk about and think about, and we've been thinking about it a lot, even within the State House, who, who has not been reflected, who has not been uplifted in the arts? And in this moment, I think there's a huge opportunity for greater representation. We're having that conversation generally, um, but I think within the arts, one of the things that I'm looking to do as governor is to uplift and amplify uh, voices, faces, stories, artists, who have not been as widely profiled. And uh, I'm hoping to even be able to do some of that within the State House. To, to see their work on view? In what way? I think work on view and, and having uh, greater diversity of, of artist representation in our public buildings, in our public spaces, right? I also think it would be great to bring artists in to our agencies. Right? Imagine our roadways and bridges and, you know, some of the infrastructure and you think about the ways we can incorporate art into that. A lot of cities have done this. They've done this very well and beautifully. I think we could do that um, on a different level when it comes to some of the state infrastructure, state public buildings. And I think it will be, uh, I think it'll be something that people will really come to appreciate. Another threat to the arts right now is, is the, the book bans that we're seeing, the, the Tennessee ban on drag performances in Wisconsin. A school would not allow a song by Dolly Parton and Miley Cyrus to be performed because it was too suggestive. They thought the school uh, administration did that it was too suggestive of LGBTQ issues. How are you looking at this moment where we're in culture wars again? Yeah. Isn't it distressing? I mean, I can't believe that some of this is being resurrected again. But it's just where we are um, in, in terms of some of the dynamics, particularly the, the, the political expediency of some of this, right? And, you know, the uh, perpetration of, of different forms of bigotry, homophobia, transphobia, racism even, in the guise of either religious freedom or so-called parental rights, what have you, right? My view is the way to fight back is to double down on those investments. Massachusetts, we're home to the first public school in the country. Education is enshrined in our constitution. We're also home to the first public library. And I'm really proud that in our proposed budget, we made historic investments in public libraries. So that is my response. We believe in books. Uh, we believe that children should be exposed to a diversity of books, for example. We stand up for those in performance arts. We stand up and stand behind the LGBTQ community in Massachusetts. Moving to Harvard for a moment, you're a Harvard alum, of course. Uh, you're also one of the people who led the charge as attorney general against the Sacklers. 
of course, for their role in the OxyContin, the proliferation of OxyContin in this country, the Sackler name is still on the Harvard Art Museums. Should that name come down? I'd like to see it taken down, absolutely. Um, I've had a lot to say about the Sacklers and just the devastation they caused to so many families across Massachusetts and across this country. So it's my view that their name has no place uh, on any uh, building of significance anywhere. Um, of course, that's something for individual universities to, to, to address. Well, the current president, and of course he's on his way out, but Larry Bacow has said it's inappropriate to take it down because of contractual, well, I assume because of contractual negotiations and so on and so forth. But is there any justification at this point for any institution, any university, any medical center to keep that name up when so many others have? You know, there may be legal reasons, and I'm not privy to all the contracts there. Um, I just look at all of this as blood money and, you know, therefore think it's a shame when names like that are ascribed to buildings of significance and, and importance. It's just as a general matter. Well, Governor Healy, it's a, a great joy to talk about art with you and to hear how you're going to move it forward. Thank you. Well, thank you. I look forward to more conversation.